Hey everybody, this is Carl back again for another movie spoiler review for the month of October. And today is a little bit less on the scary side and more so on the uh, uh, romantic comedy with a tinge of horror. And it's honestly one of my, you know, personal favorite uh, romantic comedies you know I've seen as a little kid and it's my first Patrick Swayze film that I remember watching before anything else I've seen him in and it's the 1990 film Ghost and god this dude was an incredible actor and, and from what I've heard from like interviews and from people who worked with him he's just one of the most amazing human beings to li to ever uh you know you know walk this earth he sadly had you know passed away in 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 the uh mid to late 90s i think it was cancer or something like that it's a real shame because like you know, uh, he would have done wonders in the movie industry honestly and one of those you know heartthrobs of the 90s he, he was that dude it's like you know probably like Richard Gere and uh 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 George Clooney of the time he he was that dude it's a real shame um so this won so many awards you know this movie had at the time a budget of 22 to 23 million dollars and at the box office uh, uh, it made five hundred and five million dollars. Now I'm not a math guy, but given the inflation, this movie would have done well over a billion dollars by today's standards. Uh, it is an incredible movie, incredibly acted, honestly, and it's one of the earliest. Uh, not super early, but you know she was making steps in the industry to me more which is like uh i think she this would have been like a, her like third or fourth film she done so far but by this point if not th by this movie her name would have been solidified as one of those top uh female names in the industry that people just want to cast her in a lot of stuff uh so yeah, it was directed by Jerry Zucker, uh, starring Patrick Swayze as Sam Wheat, Demi Moore as Molly Jensen, Whoopi Goldberg as Oda Mae Brown, uh, Tony Goldwyn as Carl Bruner, Rick Avales as Willie Lopez, and uh, we got Vincent uh, uh, Scatavelli as the subway ghost now uh most of the cast in this uh film has long since passed away oh we even got steven root was in this as one of the police sergeants like oh my god you'd be surprised we go back on certain movies and you're surprised to see certain characters who either big names or you definitely seen them quite a few films uh that's like hey that's that so-and-so wow he was in this it's kind of like when i saw um uh what's the name from parks and rec in the curse film last that review last week uh as a cop but yeah it's um Yeah, so, so yeah, like at least half of the cats are still alive uh, uh, to this day. Anyway, uh, uh, the movie opens with uh, Molly and uh, uh, Sam moving into their uh, apartment in Manhattan. He's a banker uh, while she's an artist. And honestly, 
like I made because I kicked myself because I completely forgot because uh, some time ago I made a video uh, uh, talking about like best on screen couples that I've seen in the film and I forgot about um, Gomez and Morticia Adams and Sam and Molly from Ghost. These like yeah, I completely spaced about those guys, and honestly, you know, I maybe mean, I should make it like a part two to something like that because honestly, those are incredible couples, and, and the chemistry is just like heightened to a different level where you like you buy like go these guys freaking love each other. Matter of fact, I should make it a part two because honestly, uh, all three Spider Man actors had great chemistry with their respective uh, significant others, which is like, uh, yeah, I, I should at some point, maybe around February for like um, uh, uh, Va- Valentine's Day, I should make a part two to like the best on-screen couples. I should make a note of that because like, yeah, because I can't believe I spaced about that. Um, but, you know, Sam and Molly moved into their apartment and, uh, you know, a few days into, uh, you know, after moving in he's going, oh, well, before he goes to his little place of work, I'm glad they immediately kind of set the tone for this kind of relationship and what they're like. They're like, I imagine this is like maybe a year or two into the relationship, maybe a year. And they, you know, finally, you know, taking the next step into uh, getting a place together. So it's like very early, you know, budding love. You know, where it's like, you know, I found my person kind of thing. We're taking this next step. And uh, I can't help but think, it's kind of messed up to think about this. But while these two are establishing like a love connection, I can't help but think that, wow. Somewhere in the world, around this time, while this scene of them, you know, going at each other hot and heavy, there's somewhere in the world, there's a young uh, action kutcher that she's going to be banging in the next, you know, uh, decade or two. Yeah, no, no, not a decade. In you know, a couple of decades, in the next couple of decades, there'll be a young uh, action culture that she'll be banging at some point. I was like, because they worked together for uh, quite a long time before the, uh, they broke up. They will eventually broke up, and action culture will end up with Mila Kunis at the end of the day, which we all knew that was inevitable. But it, it was like, yeah, I can't help but think about that because wow, she like rocked a lot of cradles in the next you know, uh, in the next couple of decades. Uh, and she's a beautiful woman. Don't get me wrong. Uh, who wouldn't? But um, anyway, I'm glad they kind of set the tone. And they, you know, uh, established this particular arc for Sam where, you know, every time she says she loves him, he responds back with ditto. And not the Pokemon nor the Ben 10 character. Uh, and she brings up later, it's like, why well, you never say, like, uh, you know, I love you back. And there's this whole, it's this whole personal hang up he has about it because, you know, he's afraid of, you know, if he lets it out, he afraid to lose it kind of situation. So I'm glad it kind of, Take that back around in the third act. Anyway, 
But they set the tone right away. And it's the, one of the most iconic and the most romantic scenes in film history. To this day. Uh, even if uh, most people have not seen this movie in years. When you see like, you know, a couple at like a pottery thing and, you know, try to like, you know, uh, uh, shape it and everything like that. And they're just cuddling, they're cradling each other and stuff like that. Your brain immediately comes back to this film. It's one of those type of scenes that is so hard wired, hard, uh, hard wired into your uh, brain cells uh, that... You can literally, you know, be 75 years old and you see somebody at like a pottery kind of thing and you comes right back up immediately. Is that famous? And there's many other scenes like, you know, like scenes like that in films where it's like you can't, you can't help but think about a particular movie. Is that good? And it's kudos to the writing and the directing uh, uh, of a particular film. Like, you can't help but think about Iron Man where you hear somebody saying you built you built such and such in a cave with a box of scraps you can insert anything but uh, uh, end it with a box of scraps you can't help but think about Iron Man it's one of those type of films uh, so like it's very well done and it, the love between these two is just like, uh, it it just it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. I'm not really much of a, like a sappy, dappy, you know, lovey dovey type of person. I, I kind of cringe when people get all like mushy about this stuff. But when I recognize it, and it's like a sensible love, not that Hallmark bull crap, but like a sensible, real love. It's like it's setting like a realistic tone of a real world scenarios. Uh, or sometimes, depending on the time frame, like this is the early '90s, late '80s. Well, well, they were just getting into the '90s, so it's like that late '80s, early '90s love, where I feel like, you know, before like the, uh, uh I I say like, cause you know relationships between men and women are just so out of freaking whack and we just don't remember like our place in the world anymore and everybody wants to be more like women and and or like men want to be more like women and women want to be like men and it's like they forget like you know certain roles and stuff like that it's all out of whack and technology doesn't help either social media doesn't help either but i think like uh, up until maybe prior to 2010, like I think that's where like the tw uh, the the twist happened. Prior to all of that, I think people understood, you know, uh, social like uh, certain dynamics between uh, men and women, and. Uh, uh, this is like a, a hallmark, no pun intended, of like a relationship goals. Where like, yeah, is she's all about her femininity. Doesn't negate the fact that she has a job that, that she really likes. She's in like art and everything like that. But she understands like, you know, uh, she, uh, uh, she, she deferred to her, her, her man. She, uh, she all about, you know, him. He's all about her. Uh, you know, he, he like, you know, they help each other with the move. And it, it's just like, you know, they, you know, they tease each other. You know, uh, you know, you know they, they like, uh, not one doesn't overpower the other. That's the thing. No put nobody's putting each other down. None of that. This is like just what it should be. I think like, you know, it's one of those kind of relationships is like, okay, this, you know, you know, makes sense. No matter really the time period, but this is like, you know, yeah, this is like, you know, you know, the should be the norm and to be like the blueprint 
honestly. Uh, and then the music. The music to this, and honestly, there's only one song out of this entire film that kind of, like, also, like the pottery scene, the My Love song. Matter of fact, I, I don't think it's even called, like, My Love, but... Um, Um, hold on, because I want to try to get this right. Uh, oh, my love. Uh, yeah, Righteous Brothers Unchained Melody. Uh, Yeah, this particular song, it's like, you know, you hear it, you immediately think about this this film. This film, I'm pretty sure this song probably came out uh, a little bit before uh, this movie was released in theaters. Or while they was probably working on it, and they incorporated it into the... Uh, uh, film yeah you know, wow I didn't think it was this old uh, Untamed Melody the, uh, that, came, that was released in January 19th 1955 wow I feel like you know thinking about Back to the Future right now like 1955 uh, wow came out in the 50s good lord Uh Yeah, honestly, this this uh this song really uh set the tone for this particular movie and it was like a great decision because I don't know, is this something about it where it's like, yeah, that's the theme for this particular movie. That's the perfect thing there was no other musical choice i'm pretty sure there would have been other great 80s songs to include uh like a good love song from the 80s they could have included like like a madonna song or something like that but i i don't know something about uh uh unchained melody that is just uh, uh, Righteous Brothers Unchained Melody is uh, something about it where it's just like no there's no other song it has to be this song uh, but anyway so uh, when Sam begins uh, um, we meet Sam's uh, friend and co-worker uh, Carl who you know they establish like a good friendship right off the bat. He also helps them move into their place and fix it up and everything like that. And they, you know, establish like a rapport. Like these guys are like long friends. You don't even have to have them say, uh, say, Sam, we've been friends for like since high school. Remember? Like, it's like you don't need to tell the audience that you, you let's infer that. Uh, which is like a Mark of a great writer, which sadly most writers these days, you know, like expect to hold the audience hands. Oh, and the poster. Oh my God. The poster is also amazing choice. Cause after this whole, like I made a video uh, a few days ago about this whole situation with that, uh, uh Cynthia, uh, Evero, who's cast as the wicked witch in the wicked movie. Made this whole big stink about this, you know, fan edit that, you know, supposed to just a f obvious Broadway fan of the musical tried to set up to make the movie poster look exactly like the Broadway poster, and she had like a shit fit about it, which is clearly everybody's in agreement that she really overreacted uh, over like a nothing burger, because clearly this fan was just a fan, no malice behind it. And now uh, I'm watching videos about this and people point out about how like, cause this 
BS, because uh, clearly this woman is, you know, supposed to, like some kind of diva in Broadway, infamous diva in Broadway. And people point out how like posters used to be because, you know, the Cynthia woman, you know, liked the movie poster because the way she just stares blankly and directly because you want to see like the, you know, looking down the barrel of my soul or whatever cockamamie thing she, you know, pointed out, whatever reason. But other people pointed out that posters usually leave some bit of mystique. It doesn't need to telegraph what you're about to see half the time or hold your hand uh, like certain scenes uh, 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 would nowadays or certain dialogue nowadays where someone pointed out like uh, like Batman Begins uh, poster or even all the Batman Nolan trilogy films they just have like they 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 knew what you was going to see anyway. They don't need to have this big, you know, uh, poster with a collage of a bunch of people because, you know, that's the nonsense of most actors these days because, like, you know, they want to be able to see their faces and everything like that. They just, like, I get it. Yeah, as an actor, I get it. But at the same time, I... At least I grew up in an era where like movie, movie posters have some bit of mystique to them, or at least you know get you interested in like, oh, what's this movie about? Uh, like you see like just like a batarang or a bat symbol, and it's a Batman movie. You don't need you know, unless you look it up. You don't really need to uh know beyond like who's starring in it or anything like that. It's a Batman movie. Rely on the IP to let you go see this Batman movie uh, if you're interested. Uh, where the fan edit of that uh, Wicked film, the Broadway musical's uh, illustration of its poster has that mystique to it. We don't need to see the blat blatant face of the Wicked Witch. You, we all know we all seen the Wizard of Oz. We know what the Wicked Witch looks like. It's a green chick who's the most infamous villain in movie history. We don't really need to see the face. Uh, just, like, have the uh, uh, White Witch, you know, whisper, uh, you know, subtly into the air, uh, into the ear of the Wicked Witch. And she had this, you know, you know, pull down brim the hat and she leaves a smirk, a sly smirk. And that's, offers an air of mystery to it. Like, what is she telling her? That kind of thing. Uh, uh, people are already going to go see the Wicked film. But you don't, like, you're going to get famous about this irregardless. So you don't really need to see your, um, you know, windows to your soul or t down the barrel of your soul or whatever. It's like, you know, uh, once they go see the movie, they'll see your face then. But don't, like, you know, have this whole big stink about it with this whole poster situation. I see all that to say this, the poster to Ghost is also very famous where it's just a very bright silhouetted, you know, uh, where you barely even see the face of Demi Moore and Patrick Swayze, where they're just embracing each other with the uh, 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 the title uh, above saying just believe and that was enough I think that was on like a VHS box sets and later on DVDs and uh, it still had that infamous kind of poster look uh, so yeah like another iconic look to this film there's a lot of iconic stuff with this film that really kind of permeated the zeitgeist forever. Uh, but anyway, uh, I like the whole friendship dynamic between uh, Sam and Carl, where they in the elevator on their way to work, and they're just messing around with a group of people in this elevator about, like, a rash and infection. like, And it's blatantly uh, just uh, having this conversation they whisper in it, but clearly everybody's hearing it and just like, 
making everybody uncomfortable. It's a very funny scene. Uh, uh, so it established like you know the relationships uh, these characters have with one another. Then one day at work, Sam noticed some uh, discrepancies in uh, certain accounts that he's trying to sift through because it, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, one second here. Uh, he's trying to tell his, uh, friend about it and his friend offers it to like, you know, well, let me look into this because, uh, you've probably been staring at this, you know, screen all day. It's like, no, like, it's cool. And he mentions that, you know, uh, him and Molly had plans later on to go see this play. Uh, so we you know, transition to them leaving the play, walking down the street, which don't know why you didn't freaking take a cab. You see like down the street, some other couples are, uh, it, regardless of it being Manhattan, is it regardless, it's New York still, uh, fresh off the eighties, mind you. And, uh, you see people taking cabs and things of that nature. And you just casually just walking down the street in the middle of the night, I mean, it's still slightly better than the whole Bruce's parents rocking down the middle of uh, uh, an alleyway just to cut corners and stuff like that, like idiots. But still, it's like, come on, grab a cab home. What's it going to cost you? You clearly like are successful people in your own rights. You can afford taking a quick cab ride home. So stupid. I don't care if it's like, like, I don't care if it's literally, like, you know, four blocks away. Take a freaking cab. You don't know. Clearly, uh, they just didn't have a care in the world. Uh, that's where a mugger comes to try to steal uh, uh, Molly's uh, personal stuff. Uh, Sam... Tries to fight him off. A gun shot goes off. And you see Sam chase down this mugger. But as he's trying to uh, turn back, he notices that Molly is curling his dead body. Uh, a bright light uh, uh, shines. But Sam doesn't go to it go to it he sticks around he's just in disbelievement as uh molly's in the hospital being uh uh questioned by the police as they carted you know his corpse away that's where uh, sam started to notice strange things he's seeing ghosts he's seeing like uh uh, uh, person, another person on the gurney trying to be resuscitated, but he's passed away, and then a bright light shows and takes his spirit uh, away. Clearly, it's heaven. And now he's like discombobulated because uh, he's, you know, nobody sees him, nobody hears him, he's passing through stuff. Uh, so he, he doesn't know what the heck is going on and he doesn't know what the heck is to do. No ways. There's nobody there to inform him of what's up. So he's just hanging around with Molly, who's obviously distraught. You know, funerals are, uh, uh, he sees his own funeral and everything like that. It's like, well, you didn't establish any, you know, you assume this is family, extended family and stuff like that, but there's no establishment. Establishment of any parents on either side, but I guess you know, don't even get all too much into that. It's not really about all that. 
Um, uh, that's when uh, uh, while Molly's trying to take a, a shower, the mugger starts showing up. And uh, despite attempts, Sam can't interact with anything. Not like he used to. So he's worried about what's going to happen to uh, Molly. So the cat that they have together... Is the only one that actually knows uh, uh, Sam because Cass has like, you know, uh, all like very many types of senses. So Sam frightens the cat, causing the cat to jump on this mugger, scratching his face, causing him to force to run out. Sam follows him via train and that's where he gets kind of accosted by this train ghost who's just flipping out you know you know uh you know and he's actually making physical contact with objects as he's pushing uh sam like get off my train get off my train dude's like out of his freaking mind uh but uh sam you know, manages to get off the train just as this mugger is, follows him to his apartment where he sees on the mailbox his name is Willie Lopez. And he sees that the guy has uh, Sam's wallet. So, um... Now, like, Sam uh, doesn't know what to do. He manages to, like, as he's, you know, walking along the neighborhood, he comes across uh, this uh, shop for, like, psychic readings where he sees this supposedly charlatan, Odeme uh, uh, Brown, and... Uh, as he's witnessing this woman, uh, you know, seemingly fleecing this, you know, older lady trying to commune with her late husband, and Oda managed to he- hear the voice of uh, Sam, which she's not a complete charlatan. She, as he establishes later, her mom and her grandmother also had the gift. And she didn't truly believe until now. And she overhears Sam call, uh, calling this like, you know, this pretty much like a crock crap. And it's like, yeah, why don't you keep fleecing this poor lady out of her hard-earned money? This freaks uh, Oda out. And noticing that, oh my God, you finally, somebody can finally hear me. And he's beseeching to Oda to help him to prevent this uh, uh, Willie Lopez to you know from potentially coming back and hurting her, and he noticed that this is a targeted attack. For some reason, this guy was sent. Uh, this wasn't a random mugging. Somebody sent to go after him and Molly. So, and he clearly he was looking for something. That's why he was in this. In their house. After some much needed convincing. Completely annoying her all the wee hours of the night. Uh, Otome through failed calls. Goes all the way to uh, Sam's apartment. And uh, convinces uh, 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 Molly to come down to hear her out by way of, you know, uh, getting, you know, like Sam telling her all very personal stuff that no way anybody else would know about. 
so uh they had coffee together uh she still dis- in disbelievement uh desperate sam tells oda to tell molly that he loves her molly doesn't believe it because sam doesn't tell her she loves him uh never told her she he loves her which is kind of weird uh but sam says like tell her ditto she relays the message this calls her to pause knowing that sam always says ditto in response to her saying i love you uh so after telling her about the willie lopez and everything like that uh molly goes to police and of course they obviously don't believe her which is something like should have um been the expected response because i'm pretty sure nowadays you know if you go to police and and mention this uh, local psychic you know talking about all these kind of this that and the third they would at least uh be inclined to you know double check never know these days but back then especially like you know prior to the 90s not many people would have been so inclined to believe in the supernatural or superstitious stuff but there's no record of any kind of willie lopez i guess he never got processed or booked on anything he man's probably just like a dime a dozen thug that just never got caught so there's no record but they pulled up uh, the record of Otome, who has like a rap sheet of being like a uh, for fraud. Uh, so this, you know, brings back the uh, disbelief towards uh, with Molly. She uh, explains to Carl later about what has happened he doesn't you know to believe it it tells her to like you know put it out of her mind but he will look into it sam follows carl not wanting anything to happen to him as soon as uh uh he goes to the door of willie lopez willie invites him in turns out they in cahoots which puts him uh, Sam is in total shock that uh, uh, Carl orchestrated all this because he was the one behind uh, pretty much laundering money for uh, drug dealers, which later on we find out will be in a total of four million dollars in uh, uh, in cash uh, back then. I'm pretty sure right about now. Uh, let me look I'm pretty sure it's probably double that by this day and age, but let me look this up. Okay, four million dollars. Uh, back in 1990 will be worth about today uh, well over 9 million so more than slightly more than doubles the amount so is hell it's practically 10 million this at this stage so uh, quite a lot of dollars so uh Sam goes to Otome uh, to tell uh, uh, tell her about like this whole entire situation. Uh, but as he goes, he sees all these uh, ghosts now and other residents 
that's you know associated with those ghosts when they were alive you know business is booming for otome when word got around that she actually communes with spirits uh what we also hear establish that ghosts can possess people or at least given in a psychic uh uh i guess it's a little bit more easier i guess because you know they're more in tune uh but also establish that attempting a possession wipes out the energy of a ghost uh But after that whole situation, you know, all the made this, you know, you know, that worked her last nerve. Tells everybody to get out, spirits and all. And then uh Willie Lopez starts sitting down and and Sam warns Adam Odame to get get out. That's that's Willie Lopez. And and cause Carl ended up telling him about her and it's like, okay, we can't get rid of the psychic because she might blow the whole spot up. Uh, this dude's not much of a, you know, hitman where he doesn't finish the job. And it's like, okay, you know, first of all, you're in a shot where it's like, you know, Otome's two uh, assistants is also here, uh, you know, in a different room. And you, uh, you got this pea shooter, probably like a six shooter. Uh, you take some shots don't make sure like you finished the job, but you didn't run away like a goofball. Knowing full well you got witnesses who seen you probably walk into this shop. So it's like, dude, you are a crappy criminal. Oh my god, this is like the worst criminal ever. So he ends up running away. And now it's like, okay. Things are getting serious. So the next best thing uh, Sam's going to do is have Otome dressed in a very nice, you know, her nicest uh, dress that she, that she owns. Goes all the way to the bank. Because the $4 million is under a fake name or a fake owner named Rita Miller. So, uh... Uh, under the guise as Rita Miller, Sam has uh, filled in uh, Otome information that she, you know he knows that can help her out. You know, uh, meeting with uh, one of the lousy like you know, uh, bank associates that that works there, because you know he had his like Christmas party last year and he got so drunk he doesn't probably remember a lot of people he interacted with, so. He uh, gets her to withdraw, uh, close the account, withdraw all the $4 million into one check. And as uh, she and Sam leave, Molly notices her. And as they walking out, Otome is, you know, happy as like a pig and crap. But Sam t uh, tells her, like, uh, you're not keeping that money. I never said he's going to keep that freaking money. And it's like, uh, that's blood money. I got killed over that money. You got to give that away. And Sam notices uh, some nun nuns on the corner collecting donations. It's like, uh, give it to them. And uh, she reluctantly signs away the $4 million to the... <laughs> the nuns that is you know who's part of this church which is a good thing and of course Otome is just like beside herself and despite Sam pointing out like oh, think about it this way at least you're getting to heaven it's like it's like it's, and she was like just stay with me I don't want to help you anymore don't talk to me uh and it's like here's the thing, you know full well that nobody else can hear or see Sam or any ghost that you're communing with. And of course, this is before cell phones, so you can't really fake like your like the whole the Detective Pikachu situation where he doesn't want people thinking that he's crazy talking to uh, uh, 
Pokemon where he's actually on his phone and pretending like he's like you know having a conversation with a person. They didn't have all that kind of stuff, but I don't know. She could have like literally done like at least a couple of things to uh, try to. Of course, they had car phones, but she didn't have a car. But she could have done like a couple of things to like hide the fact that like she can uh, uh, so she doesn't look crazy in public because she does come off looking crazy like there were pay phones back then of course she had to move around she couldn't stay there in one place but man it, it looks bad or at the very least like you know cover her mouth like she's about to you know try to wipe something from her mouth or something like you know stop talking to me because i look freaking crazy kind of thing so that way you know, at least doesn't make it so freaking obvious. But I guess that adds to the comedy of it. Anyway, uh, Sam goes to his place of working and seeing like a very frustrated uh, uh, Carl, noticing that the money that he was laundering is completely gone, doesn't know where the heck it is, and now. You know, the drug dealers he was uh, associating with pretty sure is, you know, on his case now, as to be expected. And, oh, I kind of skipped over this whole part. Uh, Much earlier in scenes, Sam uh, wants to be able to help without having to completely rely on uh, a third party. He goes back to the ghost, uh, the train ghost, who he convinces uh, through stubbornness, convince him to teach him how to interact with the physical plane. So he tells him that you don't have a body anymore, so you can't just interact just willy nilly. You have to take all the hate and love and all these other feelings deep down and focus it. Which uh, Sam eventually does. And upon interacting with one of the uh, 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 with one of those, uh, well, I guess back in the day, it would have been a lot. Like, kind of like a vending machine full of cigarettes and stuff. Uh, the train goes, breaks it. And uh, all these packs fall, uh, start spilling out. And he just kind of reminisced like, oh, it's been such a long time since I had a drag. And Sam asked, like, dude, are you okay? And then clearly this guy had mental issues in life. Because he mentions how, like, he got, you know, how he died. He mentions, like, he got pushed. And, like, he starts, like, well, you think I'm lying? Then I made it up? You think I jumped like everybody else did? Because, clearly, he probably did jump. Because he completely forgets about Sam and their past few minutes of interaction. Starts immediately jumping on the platform into an incoming train cart. And as a kid, my mind, you know, I'm pretty sure a lot of people got to this conclusion that the guy probably did jump because he clearly has some kind of mental uh instability and he kind of demonstrated through this particular act that probably did the exact same thing in life that he just did now and still in death and he couldn't bring himself to move on because he's probably just like cuckoo for cocoa puffs or maybe he has some kind of unfinished business. I'm not sure. So this is the last time we see him. Because he's just like a wandering ghost at this point. Maybe eventually Ghostbusters will come by. And in the next uh, eight years. And just. Uh, well no. Ghostbusters would have been long out. Because Ghostbusters was 84. Well anyway. Ghostbusters probably would have you know, got that guy. And you know stuffed him somewhere. I don't know. Anyway, now that he's actually can be able to interact with things, going back to uh, being in the office, tormenting 
Carl, who now is just like beside himself and wondering what the money is, he's now like interacting with chairs. He's typing on uh, his name on uh, Carl's computer. Uh, Carl runs uh, back uh, to Molly's apartment. Uh, because he's been trying to look for like this uh tiny address book where Sam keeps you know, all these bank passwords, which he eventually brings up to find. Uh, but uh, he uh threatens uh Sam that he will kill Molly at eleven. He doesn't make sure he gets that money back. So he runs out to go find Willie Lopez to go deal with Otome. Sam runs to Otome's uh, apartment, wants her and her friends, like, you got to go out. Uh, you know, uh, um, uh, Willie Lopez uh, and, 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 uh, and Carl is coming to look for you. He's going to kill you guys. You got to get out of here now. They're on their way now. So Otome and her uh, friends run out of the uh, apartment and jump into another uh, uh, old lady's apartment down the hallway. Uh, right when uh, Carl and Willie tries to break into their apartment, can't find anybody. But uh, Sam tormenting Willie, forcing him to like run out in a panic, shoving him all which way in the third. Uh, Willie doesn't know which way is up at this point. He's running down the street. Carl's like wondering what the heck is going on with him, trying to chase him down to stop him. But uh, Willie runs into incoming traffic, gets smushed by two cars. His spirit comes flying out as he's getting up and notices his, you know, body uh, uh, mangled on top of one of the cars and this is where sam sees for the first time the other end of the spectrum from the white light these demonic shadowy creatures and by the way the effects on this can be cool in some cases but in other times well i think in this specific time where you try to pick these shadowy creatures clearly Demons dragging Willie into hell is just like uh, when it comes to this particular sequence, the the CGI is rough. Uh, in other cases, when they're depicting like the white light and like the spirits inter- you know, uh, interacting with objects or passing through things, looks very good. The shadowy demons, they don't look very good. It's like, I guess the budget, like I said, this is like a 20 million budget film of that time. So they had to cook, you know, if something's going to lack, I guess they, you know, didn't put too much stock into the whole shadowy demons, which is fine. Doesn't That part doesn't really need to look all that good with everything else going on. So they drag Willie into the shadows Cully dragging him to hell. So, uh, 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 Sam gets Otome to go to Molly's place to uh, convince her, you know, about what's going on with Carl. And he gets Otome to uh, 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 push a penny underneath the door, uh, doorway, so uh, he can interact with it, proving Molly that he's still present. And the whole, you know, symbol, a symbol of this whole penny thing is, you know, what happens earlier in the film, where there's like a jar with one single penny in it, where it's like a very, very old penny that they found as they was moving in and remodeling. Uh, it's kind of like it goes to show how you handle symbols and 
uh, objects that you establish early in the film and properly swing it back around. This film does that in spades very perfectly. So, uh, Sam possesses with, you know, you know Oldman kind of sees like the love between these two, how like it means something and she sees the importance of her gift where it's like, I can help with these two because clearly uh, these two love each other and, you know, through these crazy machinations was robbed of a good life, or potentially a good life. So she allows Sam to possess her. So that way, once again, playing that song, uh, allows Sam to dance with Molly one last time and interact with her. Um, but he doesn't really need to say anything. And in this particular scene, words don't need to be said. It's just allowing these actors, without dialogue, just be with each other. And it's, and it's like very moving. But then... Things uh, turn sour as Carl attempts to break in. Uh, this shocks uh, Otome awake, forcing Sam out. And established before, this wipes out a spirit's energy temporarily. So Otome and Molly attempts to run up the fire escape to the roof. Well, not the roof roof, but in like a different particular floor of the building that isn't finished remodeling. Uh, tries to escape from Carl, who is trying to hold Molly hostage. But Sam uh, 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 got himself together, uh, knocks the gun away, pushes him around, and not knowing where he's at, Tries to swing uh, like a, uh, I, I don't know, a hook on a chain or like a pulley or something. Like, uh, uh, yeah, like a, a metal hook. Yeah, it's just a metal hook, whatever. Uh, I know it has like a technical name to it, but whatever. He trying to swings it kind of stupidly. Because I guess he's in a panic, but it's like you're swinging like an object at a ghost that you can't interact with. So all that means nothing. But it swings back, shattering the window that Carl's trying to crawl through. And it shatters, and the rest of the window comes crashing down, and the jagged shark impales Carl. And as he's dying, his spirit comes out, and... You know, Carl finally sees uh, Sam, but Sam just looks at upon his former friend in disappointment, like, oh, Carl. And here comes the, as, you know, uh, Carl looks upon horror at his own dead body, here comes the shadowy demons coming to get him, and they drag Carl away to hell. And... Sam goes to ask, like, is Otome and Molly's okay? Molly actually is hearing uh, Sam for the first time, which is astonished, uh, astonished the other two. But then the bright light shows back up. Finally, uh, uh, completing his unfinished task, you know, uh, solving his murder and avenging his murder, uh, the bright light shows back up, allowing Otome and Molly to not only hear but see uh, Sam. He thanks uh, Otome for his help, uh, for her help, and he says his goodbyes to Molly. And in a very Star Wars way, and I can't help but think Jerry Zucker had this on the mind, where Sam finally says to Molly that he loves her face to face and she says ditto and then the movie ends with Sam walking into the white light 
among all these other angels, I guess. And perfect way to end a film. Doesn't need to add anything else to it. And that was the movie Ghost. A very fun film. Uh, charming. Has its comedic moments. Definitely has some level of horror elements. Uh, but it's pretty much like a love story mixed with some supernatural elements to it. Uh, the same way how the first Deadpool movie is a love story with superhero elements to it. Uh, uh, like, uh, great acting from everybody, honestly. Especially from Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore and uh, 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 Whoopi Goldberg. As a matter of fact, Whoopi Goldberg won the most awards when this movie was uh, nominated for a series of awards like a crazy amount she won the bulk of the awards or you know in different award shows mostly for best supporting actor uh because she did her thing honestly you tend to forget given the fact that you see her on the view and all that stuff you tend to forget she is an amazing actress uh great comedic timing and everything like that uh and uh Patrick Swayze honestly was incredible in this. Now, I've seen Point Break at least once when I was a young kid and haven't seen it since. I might put that on the list because it's crazy how I haven't seen like Point Break in a, much, a very much, very, very long time. And everybody really loves that film. Uh, uh, but also there's Roadhouse. That was like the top three this, these were like the top three Patrick Swayze movies of all time. Um, uh, but Demi Moore, obviously, she was an up-and-coming star, and this really solidified her stardom moving forward. But, yeah, she was amazing in this. But, like, nobody really was lacking. But these three were, like, the tippy-top cream of the crop in terms of performances in this film. Uh uh, my, you know, at this point it's kind of nitpicky, but, you know, but how like the, uh, the CGI, you know, was lacking when it comes to depicting the evil spirits. Then with Otome, it's like, you know, you know, understanding the surroundings where she's just talking amongst herself and not like trying to do her best to try to hide the fact. So nobody will come across like she's crazy. And the fact that, you know, Molly should expect it. She might look crazy as she goes to the cops telling her like, oh, the psychic told me uh, about, you know, this Willie person's going to like come after me and what have you. And try to uh, use a different tactic or something. But like I said, these are just pretty much nitpicks. This is like a very impressive film. But um, yeah, uh, if you've seen uh, the movie Ghost, let me know in the comments below what you have thought about this film. Uh, uh, you know, what are your pros and cons of it. And the next film I'll be covering is uh, in a few minutes. Crap. Uh, is the Hugh Jackman film Van Helsing, which. Uh, it dawned on me to put it on the list after October last year. Like, getting to November, it dawned on me about the film. I was like, man, I'm going to talk about it uh, uh, the following year, which is now. So I made sure I put it on the list so I can talk about uh, uh, the Hugh Jackman film, Van Helsing. So I will see you guys in a little bit as I cover that film. So take care, and I'll see you all soon. Peace.